Hi, I'm Patrick, and welcome back to ISIP, also known as Simping for Machiavelli. Today, we will be talking about the last substantive issue area that the UN deals with, at least in this course. Of course, it does many more things than the ones we talk about, but it's the next big one after having talked about peacekeeping in lecture number two on the UN and then human rights, which we already heard was intricately linked to peacekeeping. And today, we'll be talking about development. Um, Development, of course, plays a large role in the UN. It is often considered one of the main tasks at the UN, and we'll be looking at uh, where at the UN this is done, how it is done, and um, through which means uh, it's done. So um, the first thing that I want to stress, though, is uh, on the next couple of slides to zoom out a little bit and keep some perspective as to what we might be expecting here. Um, in both the last lectures and in the live stream too, you might have noticed a certain trend that the UN often might um, uh, disappoint uh, our expectations of it, meaning it doesn't quite live up maybe to the tasks that we set it. So I think it's important uh, in this lecture at the very least to keep some perspective here. Now, the first thing is that there is a bigger picture, of course. Um, fostering development around the world isn't just something that happens at the UN. The UN is part of a much larger system of development cooperation. Um, uh, both in terms of bilateral cooperation, but also, most importantly, in terms of multilateral cooperation in the form of international institutions. So the first other institutions that we need to be aware of that exist um, next to the UN are the Bretton Woods institutions. You will have heard of these in the IPE part of the course. This is the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And you know that both of them have slightly different tasks, obviously, but their main role is really to give out money to um, countries that need it to foster their development or stabilize their economy or the financial sector in the case of the IMF. Next, we also have at play the regional development banks. So these are banks that kind of work sort of like the World Bank, but they are only responsible for their specific world region. So as an example, we have the African, the Asian, Indi and the Inter-American Development Bank. Again, they work much the same way. They give out loans to countries to foster their development and to finance projects. And uh, the only difference to the global institutions is that these are only happening in one specific world region. And then, of course, we have many other institutions that are also um, closely involved in uh, fostering development around the world. Uh, so, for example, the OECD and the World Trade Organization arguably is also involved in this, even where for some of these institutions, development isn't really their main mission. They still undoubtedly have an influence. They can set the agenda oftentimes. Uh, and they can determine uh, which or they play a role in which states can uh, achieve sustainable development and which ones can't. So the UN is really part of a larger picture, despite of how big it is, despite of how many institutions it has, sub organs and bodies that will come, uh, come to later. There are other organizations that are also important. The other thing to remember is that um, the UN by itself obviously can't provide development around the world. Um, and that is for a number of reasons, but the main one really is simply a lack of resources. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm suggesting that the UN should get like trillions of dollars in, in budgets a year, but it's important again to keep some perspective. So if we look at this is the 2018 revenues for the entire UN system. So you see here, for example, that's the main, that's the core UN system. This is all the people that sit in New York. That's the secretariat and so on. You have UNICEF, you have the Children's Fund, you have the World Food Program, recent uh, recipient of the uh, Nobel Prize. Um, you have the Department of Peacekeeping Operations here that we talked about two lectures ago. You have UNDP, the development program that we'll talk about more. So what I'm saying is, this is the entire UN system. And um, these are their budgets, at least in 2018. This was the amount of money that they could play with, basically. They had to pay their own people from it, obviously, and then they could spend what more they had on, say, specific programs in specific countries. And some of them, of course, are geared towards development. And it's important to remember that this entire UN system here has a total budget of around $56 billion. Now, sounds like a lot. 
That's not a little. If I won that in the lottery, I wouldn't go, oh, man, that could have come a week earlier. But 56 billion is about as much as the UK. So only one member state gains in corporation tax a year. So taxes that they collect from UK corporations is about 56 billion. And it's about what the UK spends on defense a year. Now, the UK is a country of, what, 65 million, 70 million or something. It's only one member state out of, out of 193. And yet this entire system only uses up as many resources or has as many resources at its disposal as one member state, for example, spends on defense. And of course, the UK spends much more. The, 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 the British state spends much more on many other things, too. For example, it spends almost twice as much on health uh, than the entire UN system takes up. So the... UN then its main role does not necessarily lie in distributing money. Now that's not to say that distributing money isn't important. So funding on the left hand side here, that's an important part of the UN's role, of course, uh, both through direct aid, for example, in terms in times of need, uh, in uh, uh, after natural disasters or after famines and so on. And of course, through its program activities, program activities are things that are sort of medium term or long term, you know, supporting uh, small local entrepreneurs, for example, or uh, fostering sustainable agriculture and so on. So the funding role is one, but we already saw that the entire system only has $56 billion at its disposal a year. And clearly development around the world fostering development around the world will cost more than $56 billion a year. So that's the funding side. The other thing that the UN does, and we've already talked about this in the human rights um, lecture and in the live stream on it, is of course agenda setting. So the money that it distributes, the UN system is only one side of the picture. The agenda setting side is maybe arguably the more important one, even in the case of development, even though development of course costs money in the first place. So the UN uh, influences and sets the discourse. Uh, it determines to a point uh, what is being talked about. Um, that's of course not necessarily the UN itself. That might be the states at the UN, but still it's an international body that's an important place to uh, set the discourse. It can set standards. It can help states coordinate their efforts to sustain development. And it can monitor things, of course, and tell us, for example, who is falling behind in terms of development and who is catching up. So we, can, we should, in terms of development, really think of the UN's role as bifurcated. We have the funding role on the one side, and that's important, but it's not the thing that is going to make the world rapidly develop all of a sudden. And then we have the agenda setting role on the other side, which arguably, in my mind at least, is the more important one when it comes to fostering development around the world. Now, uh, just a, a quick uh, sort of historical backdrop to talking about development at the UN. Um, we already saw in some of the previous lectures, including the intro lecture to, to the UN, that the UN was specifically set up to promote peace, but to promote peace through economic growth and development. It was recognized that one of the failures of the League of Nations, for example, was that there were no mechanisms really to, say, uh, cushion the fall from the Great Depression to help out states that underwent uh, economic turmoil and maybe might have turned to autocratic um, uh, revolutions afterwards. So it was always meant to promote peace, but to promote peace through also promoting development. And the approach that the people setting up the UN, the states setting up the UN, generally took to this was a functionalist one. So that was the main idea behind setting up UN institutions for development. And the idea behind a functionalist approach is always the same. You set up an institution because you want it to perform a specific function. Um, so for example, uh, the idea here is that states can achieve effective problem solving if they can cooperate in sort of depoliticized international institutions. How could those be depoliticized? Well, those institutions could, for example, have experts working in them rather than state diplomats or political actors. And that then would take some of the political heat out of the process. And because the states could then follow expert advice, essentially, rather than a political agenda, that would increase the effectiveness of problem solving. Um, because you can take power and prestige out of the equation. At least that's what the functionalists think. So this is kind of a very technical understanding of what international institutions do. 
And the idea behind it is that you can take the politics out of international organizations and therefore also you can take the politics out of international development and then come up with the sort of objectively best solution. Um, the other thing that was important driver of how the UN system was set up was that the US especially pushed for the UN to be a what's called a one tent organization. So the idea was to focus most attention on this one international organization rather than setting up 20 different ones with their own individual agendas. Um, the US especially pushed for most things to be funneled through the UN. And the result of that was, for example, that you didn't only have a security council that was, surprise, responsible for security, but also an economic and social council, which we'll talk about later, um, that was responsible for economic and social development. And um, so funnel as many things as possible through the UN and do it through functionalist institutions that are staffed by experts and can come up with objectively good solutions that then states can just agree on without having to resort to politics at the international level. That was at least the initial idea for development at the UN. And um, just going back to the charter for one second, you see this link between peace and then uh, the promotion of growth and development in the charter already in article 55 right it says that the necessary conditions for peaceful and friendly relations are higher standards of living full employment and economic and social progress and the solution to related problems at the international level uh, including uh, efforts through uh, cultural and educational cooperation so the idea was always that peace was tied to development uh, in the charter already and then it was only a question of how do you set up the institutions correctly so to say um, in order to foster this in the best possible way now um, development the at the UN has long been contentious and this will be something that we'll talk about in the live stream too but um, globally speaking so this is not just including the UN but globally speaking, the development discourse for a long time was seen as being dominated by the Bretton Woods institutions. So that's the World Bank and that's the IMF uh, first and foremost. And the idea was that much of the discourse around how development was supposed to be done and how development was supposed to be fostered was a one that uh, privileged the Bretton Woods institutions and within the Bretton Woods institutions rich Western countries were privileged again because they had voting rights and they had an overwhelming influence on the discourse uh, that was happening here. So the discussion around development has always been ever since the beginning and maybe in an increasing fashion been politicized, highly politicized sometimes where it was a um, there were sometimes competing visions, visions between uh, different sides of the discussion um, with, at least in the early couple of decades, the Western economic vision being the one that was perceived as being dominant, uh, especially through their usage of the Bretton Woods institutions. And um, that is the whole discussion that uh, conceives of developing countries as needing development in the first place. So they were seen as being underdeveloped. They need to be modernized to modernize those states, to modernize those um, uh, countries' economies. They had to undergo certain neoliberal, mostly neoliberal uh, measures. So take the state out of the equation, provide more market, um, uh, provide a, a more a more liberal market access both for the citizens themselves but also for actors outside of the state so this is kind of the, the classic model that you've heard before you know you can make all of this better if you just modernize your state and open yourself up to the global economy now i'm sure you uh, have heard this in the uh, in the uh, ipe lecture of course but that's only one possible model and it's one that was very much pushed by western states now, the problem with the this neoliberal model with which, uh, for example, Wallerstein and the Marxists would have had a big problem um, is that uh, it was additionally pushed by the non-UN development banks. So the Bretton Woods institutions and also the regional development banks to a lesser extent, um, they had the greatest resources available. So if you wanted to access money internationally as a developing state, you had to mostly rely on those non-UN development banks, but money always comes with strings attached. We all know that loans have to be paid back under specific um, uh, 
under specific conditions and it's no uh, no different at the international level whenever you access money from a development bank that money comes with conditionalities and for a very long time those conditionalities really equated to a neoliberal model of moder uh, modernization of your state so if you wanted money that was fine you could get that money but you had to then agree to follow a specific economic model and this led over time really to increasing tensions between the global north and the global south we still see those of course those haven't been resolved and also to tensions between different organizations involved in development so the visions for example of certain un institutions involved in development are very very different from an institution as the like the imf and its vision of development and what's necessary to achieve development development for states so the core idea maybe that you can think of along which these two camps can be separated is should development be mostly market-based or should it be mostly based on solidarity so is the idea that we just need to liberalize and open up as many things as possible and that will then lead to development or has the core idea to be solidarity in that others have to help you along in your development and others have to for example be okay with you being more protectionist along the way until you get to a stage where you can open up now um, this big discussion uh, also happened at the UN of course we have a whole host of um, bodies at the UN that are involved in development so we already saw this in the field of human rights that human rights was one of those issues that happened not just in one place at the UN but in multiple places at the UN and uh, it's no different from development of course maybe that's even more of a cross-cutting issue than human rights are because if you really just take a quick look at which institutions at the UN are in some way involved in development you immediately see that of course the General Assembly is involved in this and some of its uh, subsidiary programs of course the Economic and Social Council that's not surprising is hugely involved in development and um, the institutions here that are that all consider themselves to be a part of the UN system thinking about development have all formed a UN sustainable development group um, a, a few I think 15 or 20 years back or so and the idea was that development was being discussed and fostered at so many different places inside the UN that you needed to make a coordinating effort or otherwise you know different institutions might be doing the same thing or diametrically opposed things and so on and you can see how many institutions are involved in this if you just look at that there's 36 members of this UN sustainable development group that's not 36 states that's 36 distinct bodies or organizations all inside the UN that all have to do with development through a through a variety of means and I mean this can be very very a very very direct involvement right this could be the UN development program for example as you see up here that's one of the main funding bodies of development at the UN but this could also be things like the World Meteorological Organization who is a member of the UN Sustainable Development Group because I don't know maybe knowing the weather knowing weather conditions knowing climate conditions climate change maybe of course has uh, might have an influence on development so development is being discussed and funded at a variety of places at the UN rather than just one institution that creates opportunities but also challenges of course now I, I want to focus in on two specific parts of the uh, UN here that are arguably maybe the most involved and the most important ones in terms of development so the first one is UNDP the United Nations Development Program uh, was founded in 1965 so it's now been 55 years uh, since its uh, creation so it wasn't one that was immediately there when the UN was founded uh, in the 1940s uh, late 1940s and UNDP is a uh, mainly a funding body so its main uh, idea is that it uh, finances it coordinates it and controls the operational development tasks of the UN and operational in this case means actual tasks in the field so UNDP is one of those organizations that is actually in the field these are not people that are just sitting in New York coming up with good ideas or you know like say the World Bank sitting in DC coming up with good ideas these are people that are actually in the country and that UNDP is a program that funds activities in countries themselves 
So it provides grants, it provides loans, it provides uh, technological assistance, it promotes uh, democracy, and of course it promotes development through all of those things. Um, so you see on the right up here, uh, the um, uh, was one of the meetings of UNDP in the General Assembly Hall. All UN member states are a part of UNDP. And you see the um, a UNDP country office in Samoa, I believe, at the bottom right here. And what you see here is uh, a couple of things. First off, that's not that small a team. Um, Samoa is not, it's relatively small, but that's a good sized team. And the other thing that you see is there's a lot of people that look like Samoan natives. So the UNDP very much prides itself on using uh, local talent, and probably should have, shouldn't have said talent, but using local people to also administer its programs. So the idea is very much not being the World Bank in the sense that you shouldn't just have experts sitting 5,000 miles away in some uh, glass tower basically coming up with great ideas, then they occasionally give out money and then the rest is on the country itself. No, the idea is that this should be a network approach and a partnership approach between UNDP and uh, the country in which those uh, program activities are implemented. And now to just drive this point home, the UNDP, uh, at least according to its former um, uh, administrator, Mark Malloch Brown, sorry, Baron Mal Malloch Brown nowadays, um, sees itself very much as a different type of model of how development can be fostered from traditional non-UN development banks. So if you look at the World Bank, the UN, uh, the, the World Bank's funding model is a hierarchical one. The World Bank sits on top and it gives out money towards the bottom. The programs that it funds tend to be designed by the World Bank itself. So the World Bank says, hey, uh, we are giving money for specific programs that look like this. Does anyone want this money? And if you say yes, you have to implement that specific program. It mainly helps through loans, and the money for those loans is being gathered at global capital markets. So it essentially collects money from the global capital markets and then gives those out as loans. So of course you have to pay that back too. And while the World Bank has never been accused of not being knowledgeable, so they're definitely knowledgeable, they are experts in their field, their approach is also sometimes seen as arrogant by developing countries, especially in the sense that it doesn't really take into account very much the differences between countries, regional variations, local variations, taking into account local opinions about things, and that it pushes specific economic models, in this case, mostly a Western neoliberal model of what development should look like and how it can be fostered. In contrast, the UNDP very much sets itself up as a horizontal program. So there's not sort of one big overarching organization in the middle that determines everything. It's a network of 170 country offices. Um, and these programs that the UNDP funds are all designed in the country. So there's no um, sort of central hub and spoke model of a good idea coming from New York. And then that goes into all 170 uh, country offices. These are programs that are designed in the country itself. Mostly these programs focus on technical assistance, so helping the country to essentially help itself. And the funding doesn't come from capital markets, it comes through member state contributions. And you saw in the earlier, um, uh, in the earlier schematic, let me just go back to that. Uh, let's look at the budget really quick. Where do we have UNDP? We have UNDP here has about $5.5 billion a yearly budget. So um, $5.5 billion, of course, not all of that ends up in programs in countries because you also have to pay the UNDP's own staff, but most of it does end up in country programs. And uh, this organization tends to be very highly regarded by developing countries because they have this partnership idea. Um, if you look back to the picture here, you see that this is might well be a program designed by Samoans in Samoa for other Samoans. And that, of course, is a much easier sell, even if some of it might be uh, adjustments that could be painful for some people. That's still an easier sell than if that idea comes from the World Bank, for example. So the UNDP has very much a different type of model from other funding organizations that exist at the international level, and that is very deliberately uh, done. Now, the other organization that we want to talk about is the uh, ECOSOC, uh, and this is just one slide, but there's a lot on this slide. Now, ECOSOC, as we've already seen, is one of those principal organs of the UN alongside the General Assembly, the Security Council, and so on. 
So it is a body that's been there all the way from the beginning since the UN was founded in 1948. And the idea is really that you have a security council on the one side dealing with security, and then you have an economic and social council dealing with exactly that on the other hand. It was originally designed as quite a powerful body because it would have oversight over such an important part of um, states' development. Now, it does a couple of things. Uh, its core competences are mostly that it reports to the GA, so it can make recommendations to the GA about specific resolutions, specific things that should be emphasized at the global level or at the next General Assembly meeting. It makes recommendations in the areas of human rights, for example. It drafts conventions, so oftentimes conventions that are being introduced in the GA are actually debated and written in ECOSOC. And it organizes a number of important international conferences where uh, development is discussed. You can see that ECOSOC doesn't actually have all UN member states being a part of it. With the same thought as the Security Council only collecting a set of member states that deal with security, ECOSOC takes a set of member states that deal with economic and social concerns. So 54 members, uh, there's no veto, there's no privileged powers in here necessarily. Uh, but they do have to be elected and confirmed by the UN uh, General Assembly. ECOSOC and all the organizations that are associated with ECOSOC make up about 80% of the UN budget. Um, the biggest chunk that's not in there is uh, the peacekeeping operations, but uh, ECOSOC, at least on paper, oversees organizations that distribute around 80% of the money that the UN spends a year. Now, this is a difficult body. And a um, little spoiler alert here in the last line, uh, ECOSOC has sometimes slightly uncharitably called the UN's least powerful deliberative body. And for the most part, it's difficult not only because economic and um, social concerns are just difficult in themselves, it's also because the coordinating effort that ECOSOC should make is just really, really difficult to achieve. Um, so the organizations that report to ECOSOC and that ECOSOC technically has uh, some oversight over vary immensely. So there's very large organizations and UN bodies in there and very small ones. Remember the whole development group is 36 uh, organizations and other bodies and institutions. And because these vary so much in terms of how much autonomy they have, what their scope is, uh, how much institutional overhead they have and so on, and what exactly their relationship is to ECOSOC, whether they truly have to report to ECOSOC and ECOSOC can tell them what to do, or they just inform ECOSOC of what they're doing without ECOSOC being able to do much in response. Because there's so much variation there, that means that ECOSOC can really only exert very little coordinating uh, efforts. Now, that's not to say that it can't do anything. It still matters if certain things are being discussed, for example, at these big meetings, at these big conferences. And if consensus is achieved on any specific issue, that oftentimes matters greatly for the organizations that report to ECOSOC. But it's still not uh, ideally set up to achieve its coordinating function. And of course, we have an additional big problem in that we first, during the Cold War, had deep distrust between the superpowers and the two blocks, West versus East. And nowadays, we have a almost similar level of distrust between the Global North and the Global South. Now, maybe I'm uh, overstating this a little bit, but there's certainly a stark uh, contrast between economic models, for example, between approaches to development that all um, and that all is no different in ECOSOC here. So uh, it's a powerful body that should be at the same should be thought of as uh, of the same importance as a General Assembly or a Security Council, but because its own powers are relatively limited and because it is to oversee such a varied landscape of organizations, it is very difficult to achieve very much. Uh, in ECOSOC. Now, um, let's talk about development itself after we now talked about the institutional framework a little in which this discussion is happening. Now, when we think about human development, uh, the UN sort of ran its program for a number of decades after its creation and fostered, to try to foster development, although these first decades were very much more dem dominated by uh, institutions outside the UN system, such as the Bretton Woods institutions. And we eventually reached sort of the 1980s, which at the end of the 1980s was considered to be a lost decade of development. So very little progress was achieved 
both globally and locally in terms of sustainable development, poverty reduction, uh, the reduction of hunger, reducing child mortality, uh, uh, maternal, improving maternal health, and so on. And so at the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, um, the, a big discussion was kicked off in, inside the UN that tried to move away from purely looking at development in terms of poverty reduction and take a more holistic view of development. So while of course poverty was a big problem, it wasn't the only problem facing the world, it wasn't the only problem holding back development. So this more holistic view was really thought to contain um, economic growth. So it was designed to take the economy into account, but also the environment and also social development and social community in those states. So the idea really that sustainable development so development that is not just focused on you know one more percentage point of growth really had to take into account more things it was based on more things than just that so economic growth health education environment human rights and so on and this idea that development should be sustainable and that that sustainability had to include more than just economic growth was um summarized by the Brundtland Commission as sustainable development is a development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So the idea is that you can provide for the now without necessarily screwing over your children. Um, not quite as eloquent. And what was really important here is we see that this is one of those instances where the UN secretaries general are really important and they've really made very significant additions to the discourse and they've influenced the discourse towards this idea of sustainable development, even though, of course, they have no, you know, uh, no great power in enforcing this or forcing states to follow the specific idea. So um, the, the idea that was behind this kind of refocusing of the efforts on development was to get to uh, from economic development to human development. And that's really the more uh, holistic lens through which we can look at that. And maybe the most um, influential uh, input from the side of the UN into this discussion was the start of, the, of UNDP publicizing its human development report uh, the UNDP started in 1990 to uh, present these every year. And the idea here was that human development is a process of enlarging people's choices. So importantly, in earlier discussions around development, oftentimes the people in developing states were seen mostly as beneficiaries of um, development aid, for example, uh, or development assistance, as we call it now. Beneficiaries, also a, a worse word for that is victims, basically. They are just recipients, more or less, of this money. So up until the 1980s, oftentimes discussions about development were mostly about, well, how much money should we send to, to uh, the African continent, for example, or to South Asia, and to whom is that money given out? And the idea of human development was much more about individuals as beneficiaries and agents of development. So empowering people in country to also provide um, towards development was a really important step. And it took uh, Amartya Sen's concept of human capability very seriously now. Uh, and this was already something that came into play with the very first human development report. So don't let's not just see people in developing states as beneficiaries of such programs, but also as possible change agents. And let's increase their capabilities and their choices. And this was very much an, a, an exercise in sort of framing the debate, in setting the agenda in a specific way. This is what we want to do. This is how we should think about development. And, and then establishing norms that said that this is the correct way to approach development and not just fostering economic growth as maybe the Bretton Woods institutions were doing. Um, so the idea that people aren't the means to development ends, they are themselves the ends. So we shouldn't just use people basically to achieve higher development, we should develop uh, people themselves. And the UN Development Index uh, came out of the UN Development Reports and it looked at more than just economic growth, for example. Of course, gross national income per capita uh, is still a part of the UN Development Index, so that's essentially an exercise in standard setting here and in benchmarking, but it was only one of the components of the Human Development Index. 
knowledge and education was another important thing that was to be measured and life expectancy was another. So the idea really is that we can't any longer focus on just this part of the equation. Development doesn't just mean your people earn more per person. No, you also need um, a greater base of knowledge and you need uh, more decent standards of living and a long and healthy life. So a very clever way by the UNDP to not only set a norm, meaning the norm of human development, but also attach this norm a benchmark, a score by which all countries could be ordered and you could exactly see how high you had gotten on this human development index and also where you were still lacking. So this is this kind of benchmarking is something that's very commonly done nowadays uh, because it's much easier to convey a picture of where you are and how far you have to go through a number rather than a quality of assessment maybe. And this is also really easy to understand and publicize. This is the last numbers I could find. I want to say this is probably 2019 numbers of the Human Development Index globally. Now, we can play this little game again, but we're not this today where you uh, tell me what you think are the countries with the highest Human Development Index. So where the people live the longest, healthiest lives, have the highest knowledge and the highest standards of living, because we probably have an idea where that would be. And then the bottom end of the scale, you probably also have an idea about where that would be. Here, I'm going to give you a little, the little, uh, the little solution here. So, no great surprises. Probably the only surprise that maybe you could anticipate is that uh, not all the Scandinavian countries are in the top five here. Uh, it's Norway, Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, and Germany uh, as the top five, and the bottom five also maybe sadly not a great surprise. All states in Central Africa with Burundi, Chad, South Sudan, Central African Republic, and Niger. So. This is the current state of human development according to the UNDP's Human Development Index. And that also gives us an idea about which areas of the world have to catch up, essentially, in development, where we need to focus our attention, and other areas where that attention maybe might not be needed. And by the way, the UK is number 14 on the De Human Development Index, which is, I don't know, I leave that up to you if you think that's further down than you would have thought or higher up than you would have thought. Now, the uh, important thing that came out of this exercise of the UN Development Reports and the benchmarking that in it introduced through the Human Development Index was a push to come up with specific achievable goals. When I say achievable, I mean ambitious but achievable goals that were also linked to very specific indicators. So out of this movement towards the uh, UN Development Reports and a number of UN uh, came a number of UN summits in the early and late 1990s. For example, we had a World Summit for Children with the Rio Earth Summit. I still remember that because that was basically all that was on the news when I was 12 or 14 or so, uh, even in Germany, which was very far away from Rio, of course. But the, the Rio Earth Summit as a summit that focused on uh, natural sustainability and the sustainment of the natural world with the World Conference on Human Rights and the World Conference on Women. So there was a couple of lead-ups really in the lead-up to the year 2000 uh, where we took efforts both by UNDP and efforts made by these world summits to come up with a list of goals that we should set ourselves. And this um, culminated in the Millennium Assembly in the year 2000 and the Millennium Declaration. Um, so this was probably before your time. But what the Millennium Declaration did was it said that, look, within a 15-year time span, so it was the year 2000, by 2015, we want to have achieved significant progress in these specific categories. And I've given you the eight categories that uh, were developed here. So these were the Millennium Development Goals. Millennium because it was set in the year 2000 and it was thought that there by 2015, we would achieve these goals. Now, the new thing wasn't so much, I mean, it wasn't that we weren't unaware of the goals before then. Obviously, we knew that, for example, improving maternal health was important. But what was different here was that both, this provided both a focus. So maybe let's not worry about everything. Let's worry about these eight goals. They're still big enough, of course, to probably be too much. But let's, let's focus on these eight goals and also let's attach specific indicators to them. 
So eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. There shouldn't be anyone in the world that lives under extreme poverty and hunger. Reduce child mortality. And you can attach specific numbers to that. Um, what kind of um, rate of uh, uh, children dying in childbirth, for example, do, you, uh, do we want to accept and how far can we bring this down? Uh, what can we do against infectious diseases uh, amongst children and so on? And so these were concrete goals with concrete targets and indicators with, with which we could assess our progress. Before that, we essentially just said, hey, uh, let's get better at development. Maybe not the, the, the best possible idea. And these were mostly, of course, aimed at developing states because most of these goals are, were things that were much worse in, develop, in developing states uh, rather than in the Western world. Although, of course, there were still plenty of problems in the Western world. There are still pro people, of course, that go hungry every day, even in the, in the richest country, countries in the world. But this was mostly focused on the, the developing world. Importantly, we had goal eight in there, which very much was a charge for the developed world to be a part of this global partnership of de for development and provide the necessary funds, especially, and be a part of the cooperative efforts to achieve these goals later on. So the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, uh, was the first thing that came out of this. And uh, the uh, authors Fukuda Parr and Holm called this a norm tipping point in the sense that this was the first time where we suddenly had a specific set of goals with specific indicators and there wasn't really many detractors from that conversation. It was pretty clear that yes, this was going to be what the world was going to focus on for the next 15 years. Now, of course, there's always criticism. That's not to say that um, and that suddenly all goes away. For example, not all countries in the world are dedicated to promoting gender equality and empowering women. Uh, the same goes for the Global Partnership for Development. Not all developed states were equally on board with that, but it still had wider legitimacy and a wider consensus than almost anything that had been done in development before that. So it focused international cooperation and that also went for things that, that were outside of the UN system. So you can think of this almost like a franchise system that the UN set up here. Yes, the UN would work towards these goals, but if you were some non-UN organization, like a development bank or even any other type of organization, you could now also work towards the Millennium Development Goals and see how much progress you might enable uh, towards those. And so what this was really successful at was first in focusing efforts, but also in educating people about the scope of these problems, about the scale. Uh, it, it gathered a lot of data on these specific indicators because of course, to know how far we've come, we need to know where we are. And it allowed us a fairly easy framework to assess um, how much progress we had made. So that was the Millennium Development Goals. Now, of course, we have to be realistic here. We have to say, yes, the, the MDGs definitely did make a difference. That's been proven also by social science research, but the progress was very uneven. We achieved more in, one, in some goals than in others, and we achieved more in certain um, areas of the world than in others. And I mean, oftentimes these were problems of implementation. Um, states didn't always comply with the, with the MDGs or the goals of the MDGs or the specific indicators that came with it. And in 2010, at the very latest, it became clear that improvements were simply too slow, that the world would not reach the goals it had set itself in the year 2000 by the year 2015. Ban Ki-moon pointed out that the improvements in the lives of the poor had been unacceptably slow. So um, the UN does what it sometimes does. It creates either a committee or a high-level panel. In this case, it was a high-level panel. And the idea was to think about things post-2015. So now, when we've reached 2015, how do we take stock of how far we've come and what comes after? And out of this pro, uh, process of stock-taking came the Sustainable Development Goals. So from the MDGs to the SDGs. We've already talked about these a little bit in the live stream, but this is what the UN system uses nowadays. So these came out of the post-2015 process. Now, generating these SDGs went a little bit differently than previously. Yes, of course, it was still something that was primarily discussed by experts and diplomats. But for example, for the first time, the public was also asked which goals it found particularly important in fostering human development. You could vote online 
I'm, I think the data site is still up, but I still remember voting in this. Uh, so I was one of those 10 million votes cast uh, for specific goals. And one of the really interesting things that you can see, if you go to the site, by the way, I hope it's still accessible, um, you can play around with which countries and which world regions were focused on specific goals. The really interesting thing that I found, for example, was that the public has a pretty good, um, there's a pretty good level of compromise and overlap between what the public thinks is important in human development. Almost everyone in every country in the world thinks that a good education, that educating your children, educating uh, women the same way that you educate men, so increasing the knowledge base of your population is the best possible thing to do to achieve sustainable development. Healthcare comes right after, of course, finding jobs. An honest and responsive government is really important. And then we have a couple of other goals. What I found interesting, even at the time, was that in 2015, you can see that climate change was, as, a, as an issue, the lowest one of the ones ranked out of all the ones you could vote on, at least in this particular uh, poll. So, But that also shows that there's a pretty good uh, degree of um, agreement around the world as to what is important in uh, sustainable development. There was actually also a fairly good um, level of agreement at the international level and the uh, expert commission and the summit that was charged with signing off on what would be the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, came up with these 17 specific goals. And um, you can already see that there is some changes, for example, from the MDGs. So I'm just going to give you one uh, here. Uh, the uh, particularly improving child health is no longer in here, although good health, of course, is a uh, specific goal in this. And the uh, natural world plays a much larger role than it played in the MDGs. So we have both climate action, we have responsible consumption, we have life below water and on land in here. So a much more, a much greater awareness of the world around us, if you want, um, than in the MDGs. Uh, we have gender equality still in there as goal number five. Uh, so nothing was taken away uh, from that. But also things like reduced inequalities, for example, wasn't something that was really uh, much of a topic in the in the MDGs, both reduced inequalities globally between countries, but also reduced inequality in countries, uh, within countries, uh, between their citizens. So this is the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that we're still working with today. Now, uh, you might ask, well, what does that actually do? What good is it that we now have 17 uh, SDGs? Uh, what difference does it make? Well, I would argue that on the positive side with the SDGs, that setting goals is a really powerful normative exercise. So getting everyone to agree that, that were, those were the goals that we were working towards and uh, the, that there were indicators attached to those goals that we, we were committed to reaching, that is a powerful normative exercise. It's hard to afterwards argue that A, something had been disregarded or B, that... Um, and there was something in there that didn't belong in there. Uh, they're also a good tool because they're all encompassing. It's hard to think, I'm just gonna back, go back one slide. It's hard to think of a problem nowadays of a big global problem um, that is not in here. Now you do notice maybe that things like security or like terrorism or similar things aren't in there because this is about sustainable development. This is not about providing security. Um, and that the environment is in there, I think is an important step. Uh, it does also do the same thing that the MDGs did in that it focuses international efforts. So there's a timeline attached to the SDGs and there's indicators attached to the SDGs. So we know what we're supposed to do. Each country in the world technically knows what it's supposed to do towards achieving greater sustainable development. Now, of course, there is criticism. The SDGs are uh, still uh, something that has come out of a committee. So the decision making was pretty difficult. The public was asked, experts were asked, diplomats were asked, states were asked and so on. And you could argue that 17 goals is just a bit too much. If I told you like at the beginning of the semester, hey, you know what? A great way of learning things is to follow these 17 goals. You probably would have gone, oh, well, that's not super helpful. Um, and you might well be right. This might be too many goals to work towards, and this might be too sort of small, small kind of fractured, uh, a, a fractured type of approach to development. 
There's also a criticism that these goals are simply not uh, credible. And they might not be credible because of the cost attached to them. So according to some experts, and again, of course, this is like an almost impossible task, but some experts have estimated that we need about 1.5 trillion, not billion, 1.5 trillion dollars per year. So that's 1,500 billion dollars a year per year for 15 years to achieve these. Mind you, the UN budget a year is 56 billion. When we need one 1,500 billion a year to achieve these goals. Some experts have even said that the costs might be twice that to actually achieve these goals globally. So of course, it's clear that this is not something that the UN itself can provide, but even when you, uh, when you uh, rope states in uh, to this, to achieving these goals, it might still simply be unattainable. It's like you saying in year one, you know what, I'm going to get a seven, at a minimum a 78 in every course I take in every year, right? The question is, is that a decent goal? Like, does it even make sense? Like, should you not set yourself at more attainable goals in the first place? Because if you already know that you're going to fail all of them, not failing the classes, but failing to achieve that goal in every single course, what's the point of the goal? It's also been pointed out that it's not so easy as setting 17 different goals, but these goals interact. So for example, how do you still provide economic growth and reduce poverty while on the other side being sustainable? It's, it's all nice to just slap 17 goals onto the wall, but uh, without knowing how these goals affect each other and how they sometimes can work against each other, you really oftentimes get stuck uh, at, the, at the start. And of course, we can certainly say that uh, we have a lot of goals, but we have far fewer solutions to those goals besides just pumping uh, more money into the international uh, system for development, um, especially not considering radical solutions. So I already talked about this in the, I want to say maybe in the critical uh, approaches um, lecture, where I said that if you suggest in a discussion about global inequality, for example, or about climate change, that the capitalist way that the international economy is set up is a contributor to that you probably get kicked off the stage or don't get invited in the first place in this case too like um there's there's far fewer solutions being discussed at the un level than there are the goals being discussed and more radical ones like rethinking how the global economy is structured tends to not be encouraged in these discourses now you might be interested uh, in how the SDGs uh, are spread around the world. I haven't given you a map here. I'm, I've given you the top 19 countries. Not a ton of surprises here. You have Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. So the Nordics are up there. Then come France and Germany, maybe some states, you know, big industrial powers that you might not uh, expect all that uh, high up there. You have the UK down here at number 13. And you see, so these are the countries that have achieved the uh, highest performance on their sustainable development indicators. Uh, let's pull out the UK here for a second. So the UK is ranked 13 out of 193. That's a pretty solid score. And you can see here on which indicators, on which sustainable development goal, the UK scores particularly well. So for example, energy uh, is doing fairly well in the UK affordable and clean energy, economic growth is pretty good, in industrial infrastructure is pretty good, and it does a fair amount in terms of a global partnership to achieving those goals by others. But where it fails, for example, is if reducing its inequalities. There are still too many people going hungry in the UK, at least according to this indicator. And there's a number of other ones that are pointing up, but they're still in the yellow or orange, even where uh, much more progress could be made towards those. If you go to that address up there, dashboards.sdgindex.org, you can uh, have a much more fine-grained view of who scores how highly and who has to do how much to achieve these goals. Now, a uh, quick look at what the theories say about these specific things, because I feel like sometimes in these lectures that um, uh, gets a little bit of a short thrift. So um, there is certainly a strong sort of liberal internationalist and institutionalist underpinning uh, to all of these. Both the multilateral banks and the UN agencies are very much founded on this core liberal idea of international cooperation towards collective goals. So cooperative international institutions should both be the drivers and the enablers of development. So ideally, most of our funds are distributed through these institutions. 
because their functionalist approach makes them more effective at problem solving. Now, obviously, realists might point out that power politics are still important. We still have to acknowledge that the big uh, international financial institutions, especially the World Bank and the IMF, are still very much influenced by what the U.S. does because the U.S. is the biggest provider of funds for these. And um, we can certainly, we should certainly take into account a, a, a weirdly critical point that a realist could make um, in pointing out that this is simply powerful Western states trying to drive the discourse in a specific way. So the way that the uh, that development is done at the UN and how development is discussed, uh, there might be sort of a whiff of neocolonialism uh, to it in that this is a discourse that's very much influenced and driven by Western states that um, still are trying to determine how development um, should go with the voices of developing states themselves normally playing a smaller role even at the UN level. Now constructivists quite like this um, exercise in looking at the UN and development because I've already pointed out that the UN's maybe main role really in fostering development is exactly norm creation, norm, um, the spreading of norms and the setting of the agenda. All of which of course are core constructivist ideas on how to change state behavior. So these global discourses around development, the developments, the developments of those discourses and the idea that uh, if you can say that specific things should happen in a certain way and that development was to be done appropriately in a certain way is a core constructivist idea, of course, and a very powerful one, too. And lastly, of course, critical theory has lots to say about development in general and about development at the UN, because a critical theorist would certainly ask, well, who or what is it actually that has to be developed? Um, they would certainly take issue, for example, with the idea that states have to be modernized. They would point out that even fairly inclusive institutions on development still tend to exclude the needs of certain groups, and those groups tend to be the most vulnerable groups. So those can be any, that can be anything from people with different gender identities, that can be women, that could be indigenous groups. Uh, those tend to be left out of the discourse on development and therefore also get the short end of the stick uh, in terms of what development can do for them. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, I've already said that the Marxist perspective would be one that asks much more fundamentally whether the economic system that we've set up is actually one that um, drives economic inequalities and that hinders economic development in developing states, in developing states uh, rather than helping them. So as a conclusion, development at the UN is a hugely complex issue and it's a combination between pretty lofty ambitions, but also sometimes a pretty harsh reality that there is a, sh a hard limit to how much the UN can really do. The UN does do quite a bit through program activities. So UNDP's activities in countries, for example, and other UN agencies are very, very important, both short term, medium term and long term. But I would at least argue if we want to make a point, uh, if we want to make an argument for the UN's for the UN's role here, then it is through the UN's role in agenda setting and coordinating development efforts. We need to certainly have a realistic perspective as to what the UN can do, what it's done well, maybe also where it's failed. But we also, just like in the case of human rights and in peacekeeping, have to acknowledge the hard institutional constraints that the UN acts under, that the states that are members of it themselves have set up. And um, the question that remains at the end of all of this is, do we need to radically rethink how the UN approaches development, how the UN can address the challenges of the 21st century? And of course, that specific point is one that we will pick up in the next and last lecture, which is on the future of the UN. Thanks for sticking with me so far. I'll see you in the next one.